Generally, you'll get behind the moose and you'll just follow him for a short distance and the moose will just jump off the trail. But not this time. The moose stops in the trail. Janice Powell says she knew something wasn't right. His fur was standing up, his ears were back, his head went low and uh, definitely knew something was up. And then the animal charge. Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. What comes to mind when you think about animals that live in the United States? Maybe you think of bears. You're right, we have quite a few bears here. Black bears, brown bears, and grizzly bears. Grizzlies are those massive ones that you might remember Leonardo DiCaprio fighting in that famous Hollywood movie, The Revenant. Grizzlies are only in a handful of states. Perhaps you think of bald eagles which is not only our national animal, it's a symbol of the United States. You'll see the bald eagle on our stamps, our money, our government buildings, or maybe American bison come to mind, which are also known as buffalo. They graze the Great Plains. The Great Plains is the flat, open landscape that characterizes the central part of the United States. They're the largest land mammal in North America. A close second is moose. They're also a very large, hairy land mammal. Welcome back. This is the second part of episode number 151. And today, we're going to talk all about moose. When I think about this recording, there are three different parts. In the first part, you'll hear all about moose and the habitat they live in, how they live their lives, what they eat, sort of like a National Geographic style part. And in part two, you'll hear how humans and moose live together. It's not always in harmony. There's some stories there. In part three, we talk about moose populations and hunting moose. We also talk about eating moose. Do Americans eat moose? Find out. Before we begin today's episode, let's avoid some confusion. In English, we have the terms moose and elk. They are not the same species of animal, although they are both in a family called cervidae. Moose are darker than elk. They're much bigger. And I just wanted to state this because in many languages, elk refers to both species. In English, we've got two words, elk and moose. The second thing I want to mention is the plural form of moose is moose. One moose, five moose, we don't change the word moose. It's sort of like sheep and deer. We don't say mooses, sheeps, or deers. We say moose, sheep, and deer. It doesn't matter if there's one or 20. It is uncountable. Moose. So let's begin. Moose inhabit many of the northern states in the United States, especially those bordering Canada, including Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Montana, and even West Coast states like Washington and Idaho. They thrive in areas that are cold, so you'll find a lot of them up in Alaska not only is moose the state animal of Alaska, they have the highest moose population in the U.S. Over 200,000 of them live there. You can kind of picture what it looks like. Imagine 
cold, long winters, a lot of forested area. The thing is, moose have a thick coat of fur close to their body for insulation and another layer of dark, dense hair on top that helps keep them dry. Just a simple shake after taking a swim, and that water flies off their hair. Their coat not only provides that warmth for those winter months, it also provides camouflage so they can blend in with their environment, which is incredibly useful. While moose are big and strong, they can weigh up to 1,500 pounds and stand at six and a half to seven feet tall, not including their antlers. They do have predators in the wilderness. A predator is an animal that hunts, stalks, and kills another animal for food. A predator hunts prey. Predators of moose include wolves, bears, such as grizzly bears, coyotes, and even mountain lions. Fortunately, though, they have ways of protecting themselves. For one, they can run. And boy, do they run fast. They can run up to 35 miles per hour. That's 56 kilometers per hour. Given their speed, they normally choose to outrun their predators. They try to run faster than them. They try to outrun them. They can also swim, and surprisingly well. If a predator is chasing them, they may get out of harm's way by running into a river, stream, or lake. They can immerse themselves underwater for up to 30 seconds and dive to a depth of 18 feet. That's about five and a half meters. In fact, there's another great thing about their nice coat. The hair helps them float. It makes them buoyant. Each hair on their body is hollow. It's empty in the middle. So it's as if they're on their own little raft. So a moose might try to outrun a predator. It might try to swim away. But at times, physical confrontation happens especially when they feel threatened. If you're hiking and come across young baby moose, stay away. A mama might be close by, and female moose, which are also known as cows, can kick hard to protect her babies. Not only does she kick hard, her hooves are sharp. Hooves are the hard, thick feet that horses have, pigs have, camels have. The singular form is hoof, the plural form hooves. One hoof, two hooves. Once again, moose have hooves and they are sharp, so don't provoke a moose. In our introduction today, which was taken from CNN in a video called Main Couple Attacked by Moose, you heard a couple discussing a moose that attacked them. Hmm, did that moose really attack them because he was angry? Or did that couple provoke the moose? Let's hear the audio one more time. Generally, you'll get behind the moose and you'll just follow him for a short distance and the moose will just jump off the trail. But not this time. The moose stops in the trail. Janice Powell says she knew something wasn't right. His fur was standing up, his ears were back, his head went low, and uh, definitely knew something was up. And then the animal charged. The only thing I could think of is what I, what I had to put between myself and the moose. And unfortunately, that was just the snowmobile. Her husband suggested that she fire a shot in the air. So she did, and after a brief moment, the animal finally goes away. From the video, you can see that they're snowmobiling behind the moose. While they were not intentionally trying to harm the animal, you can see from the video that the animal perceived them as a threat. Once again, don't provoke these creatures. Male moose, also known as bulls, have antlers 
which are long, bony, branch-like pieces coming from the tops of their heads. Some antlers can grow up to six feet wide, and while they aren't typically used as weapons, they can serve that purpose, especially when it's mating season. Large, elaborate antlers attract females. They're a sign of a male moose's strength and health. They'll also use their antlers to fight off other males who invade what they consider their territory. Now, what's most interesting about these antlers is that every year, moose shed them after mating. To shed is a verb that means to let something go that is no longer needed. A moose sheds its antlers every year. Their largest during the mating season, they fall off, and then they regrow again in spring. Humans and moose should ideally live together in harmony. Do they? In episode 145, I spoke with Brent Watson, an English teacher from Maine, and he said that it's not uncommon to come across moose while driving in northern Maine. One evening, he encountered eight moose on the highway. Listen to this. So I knew I had to be traveling in northern Maine after dark in the spring, which is not good. So the road had a 45 mile an hour speed limit, but I really couldn't go more than 20 or 25 because I kept running into moose. Luckily, I was able to slow down, but they're so big and so dark. I didn't really see them until I was only a few feet away. And that night, we saw eight moose on the road. While driving a car, it's important to pay attention to the road. You don't want to run into a moose. Now, to run into is a phrasal verb that can mean to casually encounter something. So you might run into a friend at the mall, meaning you see them unexpectedly. You ran into a friend at the mall. To run into can also be a physical collision. Occasionally, even as native speakers, we need to clarify. Did you physically run into something or did you just come across something unexpectedly? You know, casually encounter something. It was clear to me that Brent hadn't literally run into ape moose. That would be absurd. He also probably wouldn't be alive to tell the tale. According to the National Park Service, in the United States every year, there are two million collisions with deer and moose, killing 440 people and injuring approximately 59,000. In fact, moose love to lick the salt that is used on U.S. highways to melt snow. So it's not uncommon to see them by the roadside. In an article I read on Quora, a motorcyclist said that every time he tries to hunt moose, he can never find them. But when he's out on the road, he'll come across two a week. So how can you avoid running into a moose? Well, 82% of collisions happen when it's dark. You can avoid an accident by driving the speed limit during daylight hours. Statistically, in wintertime, there are more collisions, at least in Alaska, because moose are in a migratory state. They are moving regularly from one place to another. Another point of conflict between moose and humans is more often than not with farmers and gardeners. Moose like to eat, and they like to eat plants. They are what we call herbivores. An herbivore is essentially an animal that is a vegetarian. Moose are herbivores. They mainly eat twigs, which are little branches on a tree, 
leaves, shrubs, which are woody plants that are smaller than trees, bark, which is the skin of a tree that kind of falls off, and aquatic plants, so plants from the water. And due to their size, they consume a lot, which can be a nightmare for farmers. Large male moose can eat anywhere from 30 to 60 pounds of plants per day, which is approximately between 13 and 27 kilos of food. In fact, the word moose comes from musu, which means eater of twigs in Algonquin. Algonquin refers to the indigenous Native American groups in Canada and in the Northeast. These eaters of twigs, these moose, love little, small branches on trees. On a blog from thegardenerspath.com, a woman named Laura Melker talked about what it was like moving to Alaska and needing to live with moose on her property. This is a snippet from her blog. I'll never forget the morning when I first woke up to the sight of a moose lying down in my backyard. Well, two moose, actually. Young, fuzzy, and huge. Having only recently moved into my small Alaskan home, I'd seen moose tracks in my yard plenty of times, but never the giant animals themselves. After grabbing my young son, I dashed over to the back porch to show him the two adolescent cervids. But then I noticed that my freshly planted willow tree looked strangely sparse, like an eyebrow plucked at random. With a yelp, I dashed to the front yard to check on my brand new plum and apple trees. Every single one of their leaves had been stripped off by large, moosey teeth. Since that fateful October day, the giant creatures have devoured cabbage that I planted in a flower bed, half the bark on my aspen tree, my maple tree leaves, plum tree branches, a birch tree, my sanity. My life as a gardener in Alaska has been defined by moose, or more specifically, how to keep moose out of my garden and orchard. That's a pretty amazing little story to get an idea of what it's like to live with moose in the same area, especially as a gardener. Imagine planting a beautiful farm with rows of broccoli and cabbage and trees, and then waking up with everything eaten. How do you deal with something like that? How do you keep moose away? Some farmers would be tempted to pull out their shotgun. But in the U.S., it is not legal to hunt moose without a permit. Illegal hunting is called poaching in English, and it can result in heavy fines and even imprisonment. You can be sent to jail. So what do these farmers do? The internet is flooded with information about this topic. Some farmers have attempted to repulse the moose by spraying their plants with homemade juice, a homemade juice made of ivory dish soap, water, cayenne pepper, and ground up chili peppers. Some farmers claim that this combination will make moose steer clear of your property. In other words, avoid it. Does it work? Some say so. For all I know, you might just have a very angry moose with a burning mouth full of bubbles. For our dear friend Laura, it's all about the fences. If you live in any northern U.S. state, and have a problem with moose or other animals eating your garden, I'll provide the link in the episode notes and in the transcript with very specific instructions on how Laura built her fences. As the last topic of the day, we're going to be talking about moose populations and hunting. After mating in early October, the female, the cow, 
will give birth in about eight months, usually around mid-May. According to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, 50% of moose born are twins, and when there are not predators around, moose populations can grow up to 20 to 25% per year. The growth is not sustainable. In the U.S., wildlife management agencies in each state decide how they want to maintain animal populations in their state. If there are too many moose, it will in turn affect other animals and other moose, flora and fauna, and the overall food supply. Additionally, if moose are too densely populated, there's a bigger threat of winter ticks spreading, which is an unfortunate but very real situation that's getting worse as summers become shorter and warmer. Winter ticks can infest moose fur, they suck their blood, the nutrients, and the life of the moose away. To avoid these issues, degradation of the environment, and to ensure that everything is balanced and there's not this issue with the winter ticks, New Hampshire and much of the Northeast try to maintain an ideal number of moose per square mile, which is 1.73 to about 0.11 moose per square mile. To achieve those numbers, many states have a lottery system for both residents and non-residents who want to hunt moose. So let's use New Hampshire as an example. In 2022, there was a nine-day hunting trip where 41 permits were issued. Each permit is for one moose. Not every hunter got a moose. In total, 25 moose were hunted, or as their official website says, harvested. Harvested is what we would call a euphemism. It's a word that sounds better than another word. So really, these animals are hunted. In Vermont, the same year, in 2022, a total of 51 moose were harvested. The Vermont report specified that harvested moose were used to better understand the impact of winter ticks and brain worms, which threaten the livelihood of moose. And in addition, the moose provided 60,000 servings of local nutritious moose venison. So you're probably wondering, do Americans eat moose? Moose meat is banned for commercial sale in the U.S., as with most game meat. Game refers to wild animals that are hunted for sport or for their meat. If it has been inspected by a state or federal inspection program and it gets a stamp of approval, then it can be sold. But that's not so easy. So what can be sold as meat? The Federal Meat Inspection Act defines that meat is cattle, sheep, swine, or goats. Cattle refers to cows, bulls, and calves, animals that when eaten are beef or a form of it. Swine is a collective term for pigs and hogs. And once again, we have sheep and goats. Of course, there's other types of meat that we eat in the U.S. I'm just going based on this specific terminology here. So anything outside of that box cannot be sold commercially. It's got to be free or a gift or you've got to hunt it or know somebody who hunted it, or know where it's being served. A local from Vermont said, It's hard to consider yourself a real Vermonter if you've never eaten a hunter's catch. One way to do that is by going to what's called a game supper. So a place where you might eat wild animals. Where else in the U.S. will you find things like bear, moose balls, moose meatloaf, rabbit stew, venison, roast wild turkey, caribou, so like reindeer, 
and Elk à l'Orange. It's what the Burlington Free Press would call a carnival for carnivores. One place you'll probably find moose meat in Alaska is at a food bank. That's an area where people who need food, people who are hungry, go to eat. Annually, Alaskans and non-residents harvest between 6 and 8,000 moose, which according to the government website, is turned into 3.5 million pounds of meat to be consumed. Alaska has three programs that connect hunters and hungry people. That's it for this episode. What should you take away from it? First off, plant and animal life is regulated by each individual state. Each state tries to maintain a healthy, sustainable balance of all living things, and they work with conservationists to do so. At times, that means reducing animal numbers, in which they use the euphemism harvesting. What they mean is hunting. Official moose hunts take place on a yearly basis, and it's highly regulated to maintain the ideal number of moose per square mile. In most states where moose exist, it's a lottery system to get a moose hunting permit. Each permit is for one moose. Americans do eat moose, but mostly in rural areas where moose can be found. It's not super common. You won't find it sold commercially. We also learned some tips. If you're a gardener, build a high fence to make sure moose steer clear of your crops never provoke them, or drive at nighttime in states where moose live. If you have to drive, drive the speed limit or slower. There is an absurdly high number of animal car collisions resulting in death every year. Last but not least, remember, moose is uncountable. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're interested in getting the premium content for this lesson, be sure to sign up to Season 4 at AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Hope you're having a nice day, and until next time, bye! Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.